Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we saw his star at its rising and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. So he assembled all the chief priests and the scribes of the people and asked them where the Christ would be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they told him, because this is what was written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men and asked them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. When you find him, report back to me so that I too can go and worship him. After hearing the king, they went on their way. And there it was, the star they had seen at its rising. It led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. Entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, You've got a little insert there in your service sheets. Uh, On one side uh, is a blurb about today. The other side is a sermon outline. uh, And there's also some questions down the bottom there for one of those pauses amongst the festivities today to remind yourselves of what we talked about this morning. Uh, what took place in June 1752? Who remembers what took place on the 3rd of September 1928? What occurred on the 2nd of June 1953? What ended on the 8th of September 2022? And what was completed on the 19th of December 2022? These are all dates that have some significance for world history, or at least the lives of most of the world's population. But do you notice we don't gather for church on those dates? So why are they worth remembering them? And why would you react to them? Let me just share with you some of the highlights so you're not distracted for the rest of the sermon. In June 1752, Benjamin Franklin decided it would be a good idea to fly a kite in a lightning storm with a wet tail and a key in order to discover a little bit about electricity. On the 3rd of September, Alexander Fleming came home from his holidays, looked at a Petri dish with a strange mould growing on it, and we have the discovery of penicillin. On the 2nd of June 1953, Queen Elizabeth II was crowned, and her death on the 8th of September 2022 ended her reign. And on the 19th of December 2022, Lionel Messi finally completed his trophy cabinet and he won the World Cup, the game played by most people in the world. They're all significant events, aren't they? Uh, They've all been connected to significant discoveries and impacts on much of the world's population. And we celebrate none of them like we do today, Christmas Day. So let me ask you my question for this morning. Why are you here? Why are we gathered together like this? And the very fact that you have chosen to set aside time this morning is significant, isn't it? If for no other reason that you have said publicly that the birth of Jesus is something to be remembered, unlike all those other dates, something to be celebrated. And our remembering must be tied to our reacting. I mean, why would we remember something we don't care about? So let me ask you again, why are we here this morning? Let me pray and we're going to look at it together. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Thanks that it's clear. Thanks uh, that we can read it. Uh, in such peace, uh, such safety, on such a glorious morning. Father, thank you for the birth of your son, Jesus. Thank you that we can remember his birth. Father, please help us to think about our reaction to it. Father, please apply your word to us by your spirit. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. I'm at point two on the outline. There are four good news biographies of Jesus in the Bible. Uh, Two of them, Matthew and Luke, have accounts of the events surrounding the birth of Jesus. Uh, We're looking at Matthew's. Matthew was a tax collector. He worked for the Roman Empire. He was a Jew, a citizen of the nation of Israel. And to put it bluntly, nobody liked blokes like Matthew. He was an outsider to his own people. He was a collaborator. He had abused his own position with corruption in order to feather his own nest. And everyone in his own mob hated him. He was an outsider to the Romans because he was despised as a member of an occupied nation. One day, Matthew is sitting there in his tax collector's booth and Jesus turns up. Jesus says to Matthew, follow me. Matthew does, and his life is turned on its head in a good way. As a Jew, he finally sees his nation in hypercolour. As an outsider, he's brought in. As someone despised, he is welcomed. As someone who had no friends, he finally has a community. One day, Matthew decides to sit down and write a biography of this bloke, Jesus, so that others could meet him. Listen to what he says in chapter 2, verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem. The facts surrounding the birth of Jesus are uncontested for Matthew. Uh, They're not even controversial. In fact, uh, in that one verse, he summarises the whole of the first chapter. A baby boy has been born. His birth is there in Matthew's account. His family tree is in chapter 1. If you've got your Bibles there, look a bit above the passage we're reading. It's a family tree full of famous names from the history of Israel. There's Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the fathers of the nation. King David is there, the greatest king in their history. The exile to Babylon where they lose their land is there, the grimmest event. All the key markers from their family history are there in the family tree. But if you run your eyes over it, you'll notice there are some names that stand out if you look carefully. There are actually five women mentioned, Tamar and Rahab, Ruth, Uriah's wife, we know her as Bathsheba, and Mary. They're all women. They've all got a shadow over their public reputation. If you're on Ancestry.com, you'd hope these names didn't turn up. You want to airbrush them from your family tree, but the fact that they're there in the family tree of Jesus tells you something about this family. If you look back up there in the first verse, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, You see that behind this family tree stand two really big promises. The first is a promise to that bloke called David, the greatest king in the history of Israel. God actually had a chat with David one day and said, David, one of your boys is going to be my boy. One of your boys is going to rule the world. One, One of your boys is going to bring peace like you have never known. God also made a promise to a bloke called Abraham, the father of this nation. He chatted with Abraham and said, Abraham... Through your family, I'm going to change the world. I'm going to reverse the curse. I'm going to bring my approval. Uh, This baby boy is born. We're familiar with the facts. Joseph is engaged to Mary. Mary's become pregnant. Joseph, from that great family line of David, decides to be both honourable and decisive. God steps in. An angel speaks to David. The angel says to David, hey, uh, the baby in Mary's belly is actually the one God promised, the one God promised to Abraham and to David. Uh, He's going to save his people from their sins. The pregnancy goes full term. Joseph and Mary deliver a little boy and they name him Jesus. The facts of the birth are not debated. The significance of the birth is, isn't it? For Matthew, it's not controversial. For Matthew, it's quite clear. When you look back at that whole first chapter, which he summarises in one verse, Matthew is very clear that this is God's plan and God's grace. Uh, This is God's plan and promise to do something about how broken the world is. Uh, This is God's plan and promise to deal with something called human sin. The attitude and action that says, I am God and God's not. The attitude and action that says, I can do a better job of God than God. And God commits to doing something about that. 
through Abraham, through David, through God himself coming to be with his enemies. This is God's grace, God's kindness, God's mercy, God's love lavished on those who are enemies. We're doing a lot of lavishing today, aren't we? We're doing a lot of lavishing with food and presents. We're doing it with our own mob. God does it with his enemies. It's seen in the names in that genealogy. Why else would you have those women except to say, I welcome anyone? It's seen in the nature of the birth. It's seen in the promise of God that I'm going to do something about human sin. The facts of the matter are clear. What about the reaction to those facts? What about responding to them? Well, I'm at point three on the outline. Come back to chapter 2, verse 1. Uh, when you look there at chapter 2, verse 1, you revealed a couple of extra facts. We're finally told the town where Jesus is born. Did you notice that? Bethlehem's not mentioned in chapter 1. It's only there in chapter 2. And we're also told the name of the king at the time, Herod, Herod the Great. Herod the Great was a very capable man. He was incredibly talented. His rule brought peace to the region and prosperity, but Herod was also known for being paranoid. He didn't like anyone threatening his power. He didn't want anyone taking his throne. In fact, not even his own wife and children were safe, and they lost their lives because of his paranoia. And into these facts walks an unlikely group. Wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star at its rising and have come to worship him. All sorts of things have emerged from these blokes turning up. We've got Christmas carols that talk about three rather than deal with the truth. We've got myths and rumours. We've got stories. Put simply, they were stargazers from the east. They could have come from as far as China, but they probably came from Babylon, modern-day Iran and Iraq, a 1,000 kilometres away. So we now have a time frame because they started walking when they saw the star and they've travelled over a 1,000 kilometres. They're regarded as wise because they know how to interpret nature. They look at stars and they worship them so they understand the world around them. In the New Testament, they aren't held in high public regard. They're viewed as outsiders, foreigners, who are foolish enough to worship the stars rather than the God who made them. And so their appearance is as surprising as those five women in the Jesus story. They're unlikely. Like Matthew and those women, they're outsiders. They've got a shadow over their public reputation. And they come with a question. Did you notice that? Where's the king of the Jews just been born? They come with a story. We saw the star and we started walking. They come with a desire. We want to meet this king and give him what he deserves. They've observed reality. They've asked the right questions. They've listened and they've come with a desire. And the impact is huge. Look at verse 3. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. Now, it probably wasn't three men. It was probably a travelling party of up to four or five hundred. Can you imagine if a group like that turned up in Narrabrite? We'd notice, wouldn't we? They rock up in Jerusalem and the whole city is shaken. But Herod is shaken by the question. Remember how paranoid he is? Remember if you're a paranoid king who likes your throne and people who are foreigners from the east rock up and go, hey, we'd like to meet the real king? All of Jerusalem is disturbed with him. I think Jerusalem is fearful. Why are these foreigners rocking the boat? <laughs> Life is so easy when we have this pragmatic compromise. The reactions are striking. Direct contrast to a bunch of foreigners who've walked over a 1,000 kilometres to meet a bloke they've heard a rumour about because of a star. Herod calls in his religious experts and he asks them about this king. Look there in verse 5. This is how they answer, are going to be born in Bethlehem of Judea, they told him, because this is what was written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. 
because out of you will come a ruler who'll shepherd my people Israel. They know their Bibles, don't they? They've been to the right Bible colleges, these blokes. They know their prophecies. They know their words that end in Shun. They've got their religious jargon down pat. They immediately quote a passage from a bloke who spoke 700 years before. And do you notice they're not deeply disturbed? In fact, they really couldn't care less. For all of their degrees, their religious correctness, their knowledge of the Bible, they know what God has planned. They know the town, which is less than 10 kilometres away, and they really couldn't be bothered. Herod thinks, he schemes, he plans, he calls in the wise men, he commands them, go and find this boy so I too can go and worship him. You'll find out about Herod's worship in the rest of the chapter. The arrival of the wise men in Jerusalem was disturbing. It disturbed the whole city, but it also revealed some disturbing reactions, didn't it? Paranoia, fear and apathy because a boy was born. The wise men leave the king. I'm at point four on the outline. The star's there. The star leads them again. Look at verse 10. When they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. They can't contain themselves. Their question, their quest, their desire, their story has come to its best ending. The star has stopped. There's the house. They Notice it's not a manger or a stable. It's a house. Tells you the time frame. And they go into the house. They fall to their knees, their faces go to the ground, and they worship the infant boy Jesus. They open their saddlebags and they give him gifts of immense and costly value and then they go safely home. What a reaction. (laughs) It's in direct contrast to the reaction 10 kilometres down the road and the hand of God is unmistakable, isn't it? A God spoke to them in their own language by giving them a star and then he warned them about Herod's schemes. And so the reaction of these wise men stands in continuity with what we've already seen about what Matthew's writing. Matthew's an outsider. The genealogy, the family tree has outsiders. God's a God of grace. He wants the outsiders in because he wants to deal with our greatest problem, which is how broken we really are. God's brought in the wise men to show what he's on about. And these people visit this baby and show that God's intent is for anyone. Here's an invitation. Anyone like those women in the genealogy, anyone like the wise men, anyone like a pregnant teenage fiancé, anyone like the shepherds in Luke's account, anyone can come to Jesus and to know God's grace. Do you remember the question I started with? I'm at point five on the outline. Remember that question? Why are you here? You can imagine Herod asking that question when these guys rock up. You can imagine Jerusalem asking that question. You can imagine the religious leaders thinking that question. You can understand Mary and Joseph going, why are you here? As they fall to their knees and open their saddlebags. I reckon it's a question we should probably ask ourselves today. I reckon Matthew wants us to ask that question. I actually reckon Matthew puts this account here so that we have to ask that question. Why else would you recount an event that happened months after the birth except to ask your readers to go, why am I here? How do I react to this? Herod was paranoid, wasn't he? The man feels threatened by an infant boy called Jesus. He's suspicious of Jesus and he says, there is no way you're getting my throne, mate. In fact, he reacts with murderous violence and after the wise men leave, he slaughters all the boys aged two and under in Bethlehem. Without the violence, it's actually the reaction of many to the birth of Jesus. It's the reaction of many to the promise and grace of God. There's no way I'm giving up my throne. There's no way I'm going to acknowledge your boy. There is no way Jesus is going to take charge. And it's not a new reaction, is it? If you listen to what Anne read from Psalm 2, 
where people shake their fist at God. Herod is like so many in our world all the time. Perhaps he's like some who are here today. God's got no place in my life. Jesus has no right to that throne. There is no chance he will be allowed to be my king. The citizens of Jerusalem are fearful. They know their king. They know his paranoia. They're happy with that kind of pragmatic, tense equilibrium where you walk around on eggshells because you're fearful if the boat's rocked. They've chosen a practical and pragmatic compromise with Herod. I just want to put my head down and just get on with life. Does that sound familiar? The religious leaders were apathetic in their familiarity. They read their Bibles. They never missed a religious service. They had the right education, right family tree, right upbringing, right social connections. They never missed a festival date. They sang the songs and they knew the readings. They couldn't be bothered to walk 10 kilometres down the road to meet the one they expected to come. The one from the line of Abraham, their forefather, the one from the line of David, their greatest king, the one from the line that God said would heal the world. They, they just couldn't be bothered, but they ticked the boxes. Does that sound familiar? The wise men? <laughs> a bunch of star-worshipping pagans from a distant land. Relentless, relentless in pursuing the king. They'd heard something. God had drawn them in with their own language and they came and they sought and they listened and they fell to their knees. They gave and they were overjoyed. They'd experienced the mercy and grace of God and they'd met the king. Two sets of reactions. One set, paranoia, fear and apathy, foolish. One set, relentless pursuit of the grace of God. Wise. What, why are you here today? Why are we here today? How do we react to these events? What's your reaction to the birth of the king that God promised, King Jesus, who brings peace by beating sin, who binds up the broken and the damaged? who beats even death by living, dying and rising for us. Why are we here today? Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, it's so terrific to imagine the reaction of the wise men, overjoyed and dropping to their knees, opening the saddlebags and putting the gifts. Father, thank you for your grace that brings the outsiders in, Thank you for your love and mercy that grabs a Matthew and a Rahab and a Tamar and a Ruth and a Bathsheba and a Mary. Thank you for your mercy on sinners by sending your son. Father, thank you that we can celebrate his birth. Father, help us to react like the wise men, to keep asking that question of why are we here and to know the goodness of your grace and kindness. In Jesus' name, amen.